three, two, one. Welcome to Off Court Live. That's the name of this show that we're going with so far. Off Court Live. How's everyone doing? Give a couple minutes for everyone to get on. Last last call, I said there was two weeks left. <laughs> there was three weeks left. <laughs> MJ was like, two weeks? That's crazy. <laughs> now there's two weeks left. One day left. Keeping you guys on weeks. your toes. So we're about to do a drop. Is it dropping tonight or tomorrow? Our music producer is putting the final, the final touches on the exercises. Depends if he finishes them tonight or not. Okay, cool. So I saw him this morning. He he saw me and he he, he finished up your live stroke and he goes, "We're alive." <laughs> He's like, he's like, it's stuck in my head. I've heard it so many times. <laughs> I, well, I changed the beginning just a little bit. I didn't do this one. I didn't do three, two, one. But I did say we're alive. But um, <laughs> cool. We got Mia. We got Pranav. We got Ksenia. Let us know if you can hear us all right, see us all right, or whatnot. Um, yeah, man, let's just start with that. Let's start with the tools we're dropping. So we got two weeks left, either tonight or tomorrow. The new tools are coming down the pipeline, just putting the finishing touches on them you want to talk about the mo- the the pops the new pops coming down yeah i uh, did both the pops today personally and i know i say this every week but these guys these these exercises are really powerful guys really really powerful um you know we don't talk a lot about the seven week progression but there is a progression that these exercises are following so if you haven't felt it there's there's a momentum that you can catch if you really stay with the exercise and feel kind of what they're accomplishing you know in the beginning in the in the first weeks it was this it was this kind of this foundational groundwork that we were laying they were more intensive and a little bit more difficult and now they're more experiential you're you're allowing yourself to feel things and experience things and and kind of getting into that heightened state of performance so um two new pop exercises are dropping um one of them is called Get Rich. Um, get Rich. Get Rich. This is the, the point of this exercise. It's a, it's a sensory exercise. So you're tapping into your five senses. Your five senses are probably the easiest way to get into the present moment because your, your senses are literally attached to the present moment. So when you begin bringing your attention to the actual sense, senses, whether it's sight, hearing, touch, taste or smell you're you're plugging yourself into the present moment and this is this is super super powerful because as you do this exercise what you'll realize is when you're bringing your attention to your senses you can't think while you're doing that it requ- your it requires your attention so when we have so many thoughts kind of floating on the surface and and creating this mental turbulence a great a great thing to do is just kind of plug into your senses hear what you're hearing see what you're seeing, feel what you're feeling, taste what you're tasting, smell what you're smelling, and it comes to the present moment just by, by tuning into your senses. Um, but that's not just the, the entire exercise. The, the, the real power in this exercise is you can increase the bandwidth of what your senses are able to perceive. You can become more sensory. And if you really think about it, when you're out on the court and you're, you're really feeling yourself and you're in your flow, you people use the phrase, I could, I could really feel it. I could, I could feel the stroke or I had the touch. And what, you, what you're really saying is your mind was connected to your senses, not your mind was connected to your thoughts. So connecting to your senses and actually practicing connecting to your senses are gonna help you literally have more feel and more touch and be more connected to, your mind is more connected to your physical body. You have more unison with that. So, um, that's the first pop. Do you want to talk? Do you want to say anything about the senses? Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is that people are like, "Well, I always do that." What's crazy is when you're in your thoughts, you're not. You can only be one or the other. It's not like oh, I'm, fe- I'm smelling the air and I'm thinking about my math exam. You can't if you really pay attention to your attention. Your attention is on one thing at the same time, and it's normally in competition. It's thinking too much it's like in this thought mode which is not here and now and so this is just everyone knows this i want to be present like when i'm playing i want to be in this moment right now this is like a hack this is like a quick kind of like 
hack just to like do it really quick. Just sense your five senses. Um, that's why we always come back to the breath. If you just f feel your breath, you're automatically doing this whole like sensory thing. Yeah, it's a it's a hack, but you can also take it to an extremely high right. level. And you and then the more you practice it, the more it's just easy to like. You, you start feeling your stroke, you start feeling the court, you start feeling the match. Um, I think this is where the phrase stop and smell the flowers came from. Yeah, like, wake you should up. stop thinking and smell the flowers. Wait, Tune wake into up your and senses. Wake up and smell the roses. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Wake up. So um, that's the first pop exercise that's dropping. Get rich. You're increasing the richness of your experience, um, which is awesome anyways. Who wants to have a dull experience? Um, the second pop that's dropping is called Destination Air. I had the idea for this exercise a long time ago, and it was very recently that I, I finally sat down and wrote the exercise, and it was, it was a lot of fun to write it. Um, what this exercise is all about is you hear us talking about being destination oriented, and really what that means is when, when our motivation is to get an outcome, we're we're, that's what it means to be destination oriented or outcome oriented. And in the beginning, it doesn't, that doesn't sound like anything, like you can't really feel the negative effects of being a destination oriented. It's more of a, it more has this long-term effect because what begins to happen is your subconscious gets uh, habitually used to always checking your outcomes based according to the destination you wanna to get to. So sometimes, you know, and I'll speak from personal experience, this used to happen to me all the time. I wanted to be a professional soccer player. So anytime I ever did anything that didn't line up to that, I felt bad about myself. I didn't feel like I was succeeding, even though I was in this part of my process and that was completely okay to be getting those kinds of outcomes. So when we're destination oriented, it just takes a toll. So much of our energy is, is and our attention is just flying into the future and cross-referencing the present to the future to make sure we're on track to hit this destination. And it's very taxing. Um, so what this exercise is all about is realizing that the journey is the destination. There's no place you get to. The, the, the process you're undergoing called your life is the destination. The, the, the point of life is to experience and live life as authentically and boldly as you possibly can. And so then what this exercise does is it helps you experience the present moment as the destination. And so how would you feel if you're like, man, I made it. I've arrived. That, 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 that feeling when you like land up on the plane on vacation, and you're just like, because oh. like the point of vacation is to be there. Once you're on vacation, like you're really not trying to get anywhere. You're just like, you know, you're in Disney World. You're just experiencing things. You're just, you know, whatever. You're on vacation. You're just, you're just pulling it in. You're just receiving. The point is to be there. So once you, the more you can realize that the point is to be here, to experience what this moment is giving you and be at this point in your life, the more you see the present moment as the destination, the less resistance we have to um, the ups and downs of our process. We're not so, we don't get so emotionally pulled from the, from the ups and downs. And so the point, the, the, how the exercise works is you really get into that state of that feeling, that feeling the present moment is I've arrived, I've made it, this is the destination. And then you breathe in the air as if you're breathing in destination air. This is, and so you're just, that feeling like you're on vacation and you're doing like 10 or 12 minutes of breathing. It's, it's, a, it's a lengthy breathing exercise. It's extremely powerful. It should be very, very uplifting. Do not take this exercise seriously. This is the opposite of being serious. Again, a lot of the groundwork was laid in weeks one, two, and three um, of this seven-week cycle. As we enter into week six and week seven, we're getting very into the opposite of that, where we're, where we're opening up and feeling... Um, feeling the subtleties and the, and the touch of our stroke and, the, and just the subtleties of what we're doing. Um, and so it's a powerful exercise. It's a lot of fun. I love it. I'm looking yeah. forward to doing that. Um, that's it for the prompt. That's yep, it for the that's mind. That's it for the, the pops, yep. So for the body, we're going to be releasing, drum roll, Andrew, Prime 11. And Ooh. Oof. Prime 11, it's, uh, it takes it to another level. It's probably gonna be um, the hardest workout a lot of people here um, have done. It just, it just bumps it up a notch. And so don't click Prime 11 unless you're ready to like, 
you don't, know. Don't dip, your, don't dip your toe in the water. Don't dip your toe in the Prime 11. I'll leave <laughs> some of the older ones up there to just do one of those. But like, if you want to go after it, um, it's a little bit longer. The dirt, the time duration of the workout, actually, some of these earlier Primes have been like 40, 45 minutes. This bumps up a little bit more. And it's going to push you. It's going to challenge you, but you're like super ready for it. And so just go into it with as much in, engagement, intensity, involvement. Just go in there with everything you have and just do it. Just do it. I'm really excited. I won't like uh, talk too much about it. You're familiar with the exercises. It's just going to be longer and harder. And um, it's what, gonna, what would be your one piece of advice to, to prepare so they don't dip their toe in the water. What, what, what's well, the master trainer say about Prime Eleven? This is my this is my my advice is what I just said. Don't click on it unless you want to <laughs> do it. Like there's like I'm not like that's not like a funny joke. That's not like a, oh Prime Eleven is crazy. I'm like no seriously, don't click on it unless you want to train. Like you want to give the next like fifty minutes of your life to go in, go in giving everything for it and there's nothing against if you don't click it it'll be up here in a future cycle too so like you don't even have to do it this cycle if you don't want to but like you know if you're gonna do it you just gotta commit to it it's almost like i don't know just like when you're gonna do something like really hard like let's say you're gonna like for extreme example let's say you're gonna climb mount everest you want to climb mount everest you, you're, you, that's going to require some commitment. You're not going to just dip your toe in that. Well, I'm going to walk a few steps and then it's not my cup of tea. I'm going to walk back down. No, you like the preparation of like the training of like the getting there and the doing it. So it's like, well, that's why you can do such an extreme thing. All right. And so um, there's some commitment involved before you even do it. And that commitment can carry you so far can carry you through like a lot of stuff but the commitment has to be made um before you even start it's a very similar messaging to what you learned in prime one i don't know if you guys remember prime one it's decision time make a decision to do this entire workout without dropping it's like that except for it's just going to be you know harder than prime one but it's like you have to commit to it before you do it and like hold yourself to that right hold yourself to um Giving it everything you have, whether you're successful in doing it perfectly or not, is not really the point. And only you can be the judge of that. Even if you were training here in person, it's hard for me to like really tell if someone has a little extra or like if they're holding back. So just commit to it. Go all in. It's a practice of intensity. It's a, a practice of focus. It's a practice of engagement. And it's a way to get extremely strong, extremely fast. So that's what we got for the body. Um, it's the only one dropping. Well, it's the only um, it's the only new one dropping. Cool. It's the only new one dropping. Um, so Prime Eleven, we're gonna introduce it, and I might I might hold it up there. I might hold it up there for the rest of the cycle, um, because it is a it's a it can be a lot, <laughs> right? So that's what I'll say about the bodies. Um, do you guys have any questions? Let, let, let us know. Um, we got Edmonds in the house. What's up, brother? Um, if you guys have any questions, now's the time. Um, we have, we're going to go over some questions at the end, but um, if you guys are on this call and you have any questions or you want us to explain anything in more detail, let us know. Let's move on to the stroke exercises. Dream stroke. What's the dream stroke popping? <sighs> The dream stroke that's going to be dropping is, I'll probably say it's my favorite, it's my favorite dream stroke of, of the cycle. Um, I was so excited to write this one. This is like, if you think about the, the, the pinnacle of what dream strokes represent, and a lot of times the pinnacle of being an athlete comes down to this one word. We use this word all the time, and that word is flow. Okay? So dream stroke flow is dropping. Um... You know, we, we, we've done so much research on what, what's, what's called a flow state. I mean, essentially every single person has an opinion on this. I mean, scientists have talked about flow state. Philosophers have talked about flow state. 
athletes have talked about flow state. Even creative, all kinds of creative to talk about flow state. And it's like this elusive flow state. And I remember when I was writing this exercise, I was just kind of sitting there just laughing to myself on like how to describe something that's like you can't describe it, right? You can't like recreate. Every time you like try to get in flow, it's like that's literally the worst way to, to, to achieve that state. <laughs> it's because like it's the opposite of trying. And there's not really a word for that. And it's hard to kind of wrap our mind around what it means to be in flow. Um, and so... You know, I don't know how much I want to say about this exercise besides that. Um, you know, there's there's a flow to the present moment. You know, there's a there's like a pace to like the present moment, and getting in touch with that is um, is important as we let go of judgments. You know, something I say in the exercise is every time we make a judgment about what's happening, and if you just th- you think about it in the match. Every, almost every single thought you have is a judgment. These judgments are just flow stoppers. They're like mental stop signs, okay? And so every time you're like, well, this is good and that's bad and I'm good in this situation, I'm bad in that situation and oh, I like that but I dislike that. I usually win here, I usually lose there. Like you're making these mental um, like predictions, assumptions like all the time. And these are like mental stop signs. And so flow is not something you can achieve it's not a place you can get to um, because it's always there. It's there 100% of the time. You can only get in the way of the flow. And I'll just kind of wrap this up with, with saying one thing. There, in my opinion, there is no such thing as flow state. There's no flow that you get into. What flow is, is when you are connected to the present moment. So the flow really is this inner flow the more you're listening, listening to yourself, listening to that, you know, like your intuition and that inner voice. Like we want to play intuitively. We always want to play intuitively and we can feel when we're playing intuitively, we're in flow. So like, how do we like access that intuition? You know, that's kind of this, this like this, the intu- like how do you access the intuition? Every time we make a judgment, we're disturbing our mind. It's like we're disturbing all of this water. Okay, and you can't do anything to make water become still. You have to just stop disturbing it. Okay, so in the same way, you can't access your intuition. You can only stop making judgments. And so when we stop making judgments, which means there's less mental turbulence going on in our mind and less emotional patterns getting triggered from those thoughts, our our intuition and this these insights this intuitive play like begins to arise and we and we can feel it and contrary to popular belief your intuition doesn't usually speak in words okay so if the all the words in your head that's really not your intuition your intuition is it like nudges you it's it's almost always if i mean maybe sometimes it'll <laughs> it'll pop in your mind as a word but it's nudging you you know when you're when you're in the zone and you're and you're in the middle of the point, it's so fast, it's so quick, and you're making these decisions at lightning speed, and that's your intuition just nudging you in these directions. And if you're not um, free enough, if you're not fluid enough, if you're too busy making judgments, you can't, you can't stay responsive enough. And that responsive fluidity is following that inner flow, and that is the flow. And so the reason why nobody can quantify the flow state is because this inner flow is like if you if you the inner flow is where you are meeting this moment. Are you the same you as you were yesterday? Is this moment the same as it was yesterday? So you're saying two unique things are coming together. You can never recreate it because it's new every single time. The every time you try to recreate something, you're not going to access flow. And so listening to that that tap like letting go of the judgments, getting into this observation mode, the observation part of our mind and listening to this inner flow and allowing that to guide you is what's going to allow the intuition to rise to the surface and guide your actions. And the more we can practice being in that state and and staying in that state, the more we can do that under pressure um, when it actually matters in the match. That sounds sick. Um, Yeah, I'm excited to do that one for sure. Live stroke. um, So that's, that's dream stroke. Dream stroke flow, yeah. Dream stroke flow. Moving on to live stroke engage. Um, I had fun with this one too. It's going to be, um, 
you know, all the live strokes in comparison to dream stroke are, are about a little bit more intense and they're a little bit more, you know, directing that um, kind of like energy, so to speak, your attention and everything like that. And, you know, live stroke engage just kind of brings that up a notch. All right, getting your mind and your body ready to fully engage with the moment. And if you remember in all the lot previous live strokes, when I say when when you recover to ready position, and I say like hold your racket, like a sword, like and you're ready to like go into battle, like that's the state of engagement. Obviously, no one here has been in combat before, but um people have been in combat. There were people with swords going into combat and they were humans with feelings that were ready to engage. And you can harness it, not to that degree because it's not necessary, but you can harness this like engagement to your opponent, to the ball, to the court, to the game. And you'll, it's crazy because you'll, you'll like, you'll be way more engaged. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so this is just a tool to kind of unlock these states that humans are capable of humans are capable capable of engaging at extremely high levels it just usually doesn't happen unless there's danger involved but you don't need the danger that's like a like that's why actually why um i think anyone here is like fans of the x games like extreme athletes those guys get in flow because if they mess up they die you know sean white on the half pipe you know, he, he's in flow because it's necessary for a survival. So Roger Federer's in flow too, but he's got to do it a little bit a different way because he doesn't have these danger kind of like triggers. And so this exercise helps you kind of trigger these. Um, I mean, this, this is going both on your exercise too, but like mm -hmm. we're doing it like directly with your attention here at Live Stroke Engage and getting you ready to fully engage. Um, it's a little bit different of a, uh, I introduced this new thing that um, no one here has really done before. Yeah, you should explain that. It's called shutters. Yeah, let me, let me explain that for a little bit. There's a mental, there's a physical warm-up that I've seen, like, and I've done, I've seen professional athletes do this. And essentially what you do is you contract every single muscle in your body. I'm, I'm talking every single muscle you're in control of you contract it at the same time and then you release it like really fast. Like it's crazy, but it gets everything fired and turned on. I introduced that in this um, live stroke engage. We do it a little bit slower. I ease you into it, but essentially you fire every single muscle, relax, fire, relax, fire, relax, fire, relax. And pretty soon your muscles are just like so poised to just do anything. They're like on um, alert. They're like ready. Like if you if you got out of bed and I was like, play a match right now, play a match, you 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 couldn't do it. Your muscles aren't on, they're not ready, they're not ready to receive information from the brain and stuff. Well, that connection can be heightened and strengthened, and which is what you're trying to do with a warm-up anyways, but you can do it to like super high degrees. Like if you got the skills and the techniques and the and the strategies, you can warm up in this chair. And I, I can give you the best warm up. Well, let me rephrase that. I can teach you to have the best warm up of your life in this chair. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you don't even have to hit anything. Yeah. You can just warm up in this chair. And I know athletes that have like tried this, like, because they don't want it. They don't want to be dependent on, oh, there's an open court. Oh, 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 I don't have my drink. I don't have my, I don't have my drink. I don't have my banana screwed like no I, I can just close i can just warm up boom ready to go so that's what this exercise is going to do it's super awesome great one to do right before you play i mean great one to do right before you practice or play in the tournament um this this mentality alone of engaging is um you know i think a lot of times as athletes we can just get stuck in this just like throwing ourselves at our sport and just like you know, like this, this tossing ourselves. And it's like, that's not, that's not what it means to like give everything. Like when you give everything, you get dialed in. It's not this just like effort fest of like throwing your muscles in every single direction and, and diving for the ball and be like, oh, my effort. It's like, no, like there's an intent, there's an, there's an intensity, a mental intensity that requires this engagement. 
Um, so just the mindset alone is so powerful. And uh, if you guys haven't noticed thus far, the live stroke and the dream stroke every week work in tandem They're two sides of the same coin. The live stroke you tends to tends to work on our energy that is directing this intense directing energy. And the dream stroke works on this receptive, allowing, go with the flow, be responsive type things. But it's like, can you just be responsive and win tennis matches? No. Can you just throw yourself into things and win tennis matches? No. You need to be able to do both of these things. You need to be able to be responsive and engage. Listen, engage. Be relaxed enough to see, to hear your intuition, but then engage. And you need to be able to do both of them. So the live stroke and the dream stroke if you guys haven't noticed, work in tandem every single week. They're two sides of a single coin, and that coin is complete performance. We got some cool tools coming down the pipeline that's going to combine live stroke and dream stroke. So stay tuned for that. All, all in the same tool. So like you don't even know if it's a dream or a live. It's because it's completely different. Um, got to, let's do a couple questions. Got some time for a couple questions. Got a question in. Is it okay to self-talk out loud? I mean, it's definitely okay. You know, <laughs> the mental game, a big part of the mental game is getting out of this th right, wrong thinking. Okay. You want to exit the right, wrong thinking as you don't want to think in terms of right, wrong or good, bad, uh, because all of that is, this is right and wrong compared to a destination. This is good and bad compared to a destination. So you want to kind of remove, um, you know, I'll ask, you know, if, if, if it makes you feel better, I would say do it. Um, you know, being able to express ourselves, uh, you know, a lot of times, this is a whole nother thing, but a lot of times, like, we don't feel like people are listening to us. A lot of humans feel this way. And so our expression and our voice gets very backed up. And so we have a lot of things that we want to say, we want to express. And so saying things out loud is a, is a powerful way of doing that. Um, if someone can listen, it's even way more powerful. There's something with our mind when another human being is listening to what we're saying and just listening. They're not commenting on it. They're not trying to change you, fix you, solve you, or give you advice. It's a very powerful. And we're going to, we actually, I want to set up um, this within the CP community of, of, of sharing and listening and stuff like that. Um, me personally, I'm not a big self talk person. I think self talk n normally just creates mental turbulence. Um, there's nothing there's nothing about talking that's going to help you perform um, on a more human if you feel like you need to express things or you need to say things out loud do it but if you're trying to do something with self-talk or make self-talk more effective or get rid of self-talk i don't know i don't think that's necessarily an effective strategy from that front um the most effective thing besides really sharing if you really feel like you need to speak you need to speak and maybe it's after doing this pop speak exercise you feel the need to like say your say your thoughts out loud do it do it but don't do it on the match court there's really or, or really don't even do it on the practice court find a friend find a parent or sibling and and kind of speak your truth and just do that but besides that the most effective thing you could possibly do is silence stillness spaciousness you feel those things because just let's just do it let's just do it for like 15 seconds mm -hmm. i want you guys to listen to the silence, okay? Listen to the silence. And even if you hear noises, like, actually I'm gonna pre-frame this because this is something I've been thinking about a lot. In this space that we're in, how much noise can fit? Like, can it fit this loud? This loud? This loud? There's a lot of loudness that can fit in this, right? What's holding that space? Silence. Silence is like space, essentially, but for noise. And so there's so much silence. There's so much. Like you can fit the noise of an atomic bomb. That much silence is in this room. It can fit that much noise. And you think about it like that, it's like that's some deafening silence. Okay? So you can really tune into silence. And I promise you, the most effective thing you could possibly do for your mental game is listen to silence. Because if you're listening to silence, it's the fastest, most assured, guaranteed way to plug yourself as deeply in the present moment as humanly possible. Because you cannot have a thought and listen to silence simultaneously. You can't do it. 
So 15 seconds. Imagine an atomic bomb's worth of noise. The silence holds that space. That atomic bomb is not going off right now, so let's just listen to that silence. Now, what you might have found is some thoughts popped in there. That's okay. It's very normal. It's really hard to listen to silence. There's a reason why it's the most effective. It's also because it's really, really challenging to do. But it requires this intensity. Like you need this level of like live stroke intensity type where you're like, no, like I'm actively listening to silence. So you're like actively doing nothing. Um, it's going to outdo any, time, any kind of self-talk or, or speaking your thoughts out loud. Um, it's one of the most powerful things to do. Yeah, I love it. So someone said Andy Mur Murray's a bad example of the not talking out loud. <laughs> well, notice he said it's not good or bad because, like, listen, like you find what works for you. Yeah, like honestly, like there you. there are some athletes that need to like verbalize, like on you know the court, and yeah. that just you know he's a pro. We're know, so. we're human beings, okay? So like you don't want to play this game of perfect. There's no. Because like you're you're in a unique process. Like Andy Murray, he didn't make it. Tennis players can get a lot better than Andy Murray. Twenty five years from now, Andy Murray is not going to be in the top, wouldn't be in the top hundred. Just put it that way. That's how good athletes are getting in every sport. That just look at the progression of every single sport. So that's going to happen. And so Andy Murray hasn't tapped out his potential yet. And so he's still in a process. He's still regulating emotions, just like you guys regulate emotions. And so you can't look at that and be like, that's what you do because Andy Murray's living his process. Now, can you use that as an example because he's a really good tennis player? Yes, you can. But if it doesn't work for you, don't do it. But also don't put it on a pedestal like it's the right thing to do either because that's not it. But what I will tell you is there's a fundamental fact. When you're rooted in silence, your mind and body become so cohesive that you can remain in a state of flow for as long as you want which people like Andy Murray and the best tennis players are still incapable of doing. That's how much room is at the top of tennis for tennis players to go into. And that's how much, that's why mental training is the final frontier. Very few people have even scratched the surface of what the mind is actually capable of doing. Even professionals are still ludicrously out of their emotions. We were just talking to my sister. She's at a pinnacle, like veteran athlete. Still there's thought processes and emotional patterns that she's working through and facilitating and, and processing and stuff like that. So don't play the game of perfect, don't play the right or wrong, don't put some type of technique on a pedestal, but understand a fundamental fact that the more rooted in silence you are, the more re established and, strength and strong your mind-body connection is, and it's gonna allow you to facilitate that inner flow and listen to the, the intuition that's gonna be able to guide your decisions. I love it, got another question. I have final exams this week, and I'm tr and I'm having a lot of trouble dealing with stress. Do you have any tips? Silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, stress on the exams, man. It's no joke. I don't know if my advice is good in this. <laughs> I I I wasn't a person who liked school very much. Um, <laughs> we were just talking about how I had to sit recess in third grade like every day. I was so traumatized from it still. Um, you know, an exam is just like a match. And this is the way I actually see competition. This is where it's like, yo, it's, it's over. You studied, you practiced, you did your thing. Like, there's literally no point to worry. Like, you, you can't do anything that's going to like magically turn you into Einstein. And it's like, whenever it comes to competition, you'll realize the less you try, the better you perform. The less you try at the exam, the better you're going to perform. And so again, you can also go the silence route. The more rooted in silence you are, I mean, the, it's, a, it's a fact that the brain records every single piece of data that your senses have ever picked up, ever. It's in your subconscious or it's in your unconscious. Including all the test answers. It, it, not kidding, it's there. It's a, it's, a, it's a proven fact that all of these impressions within your brain have been recorded. And so actually, if you've heard it, 
if your teacher didn't completely mess up and didn't teach you something, that means you heard it and it's in there. And just think about it. Let's, let's, let's go back to um, the get rich pop exercise. So the get rich prop exercise is helping you tap into your senses. You're getting out of this analytical thought. Analytical thought is, is the least intelligent part of your brain. It's, it's logically connecting things. It thinks sequentially, whereas your intuition thinks about multiple things simultaneously. It can only think about one thing sequentially. So you're not going to access those deeper parts of your um, intelligence. You're not going to really access your subconscious and allow your subconscious mind to, to bring the answer to the forefront of your attention if you're just sitting on the surface playing with logical thoughts all day. And the more stressed you are, the more you're just, pl you're just sitting on the surface. Because as stress, we sit on the surface of our mind. That's what stress does because it's a survival response. It wants us on the surface so we can deal with the literal survival. There's nothing to survive in an exam. You want to let go of that. And as you connect to silence or stillness or spaciousness, whichever one works best for you, they're all the same thing, you, the, the turbulence in your mind begins to dissipate and you can connect to deeper parts of your subconscious and you can really, I mean, it's just like the, the, you're more intelligent. You're accessing more of your intelligence. Um, one thing I would highly recommend is, you know, this is an easy way of, this is a simple way of kind of putting it, but the way our brain works is it keeps like track of short term stress. So if you like meditate for like two hours, or something you just just sit there just sit in silence or sit as still as you can for as long as you can every single second you're just sitting there in stillness your brain which held on to the tension held on to this this stress and this accumulation of tension it's going to it has space to then let go of it only when you're still only when you're silent only when you're sensing space so when you're doing that it's letting go of that and I think we've all actually actually experienced this. You were just saying it to, to Zion today um, that sometimes coming off a long break, like coming out, you haven't played in a week, you haven't played in two weeks, you come out, you ball out, like unstoppable. And you're just like, well, I usually have to like prepare and stuff for this. When we rest that much, what's happening is just naturally because you're not in a stressful situation of really like pushing yourself athletically, your short-term stress is level is just going down and that's like short-term stress is kind of getting cleared just naturally and organically. And so you just wonder, why did I play so good right when I came back? It's like, because you weren't stressed out. Because you weren't doing much when you were injured or sick or wherever, whatever reason, or you're on vacation for a couple of weeks, that short-term stress levels goes down. So if you're really stressed, every single minute counts. How much can you just sit there in stillness? How much can you just sit there in silence? What's going to happen is your brain is going to let go. It's going to have the space to let go of that short-term stress. And it's just like, we've all kind of had that feeling where it's like, I'm thinking 10 times better than I normally think. I mean, for example, I had a migraine headache yesterday and I couldn't do anything all day. Okay. I have so much energy today. There's so much energy today. That's what happens. The sh it helps clear the short-term stress and cognitively, physically, you're more on the top of your game. Yeah, that's that's good advice, and it might be counterintuitive when the uh, when it's exam week because it's like you're trying to cram, you're trying to study a lot, and um, but if if there's one person in the world that is the master test taker of finding the balance between cramming and doing nothing or relaxing or sitting still, <laughs> it's this guy. This guy took like a full on pilot's course. He got his like pilot's license in like three hours, no, I'm just kidding, like eight weeks or something like that, or six weeks or something like that. And so like the enormous amount of studying in a very short time. So share some, share your wisdom, man. Yeah. I mean, going just through the military, um, and it, with a job I was trained for a super, super high academic load. I mean, I went to college and everything, and this is just like another level of academic load pushing you to your brink. Like if you would do great, they would just give you another thing to do that you didn't study for. If you did great, randomly did great on that, they'd just give you another thing to do and like pushing you to failure in academic settings and like that kind of thing. And like, so I would have to balance like studying, sleep, and just like being still, you know? And what was crazy was that's when I really started to discover that cramming didn't do a lot. And that like, 
I would perform because I would see it annotatively the next day how I would perform under pressure. And so I would start to get my sleep up a little bit instead of cramming into the night. Oh, my performance was better there. Or I would balance like instead of studying for 30 minutes, sitting for 30 minutes and just trying to like recall. So you want to like kind of play around with that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, another part of this too, because this is not, we're, all this is talking about reducing stress and like kind of letting some stuff go. But what's causing the stress is all of this like thoughts and stuff. And so sometimes you have to address that and you have to logically kind of like think about, you know, why you're stressed about the exam in the first place. And so you can log logically kind of shift perspectives that way take too. Take the pressure off yourself. To take the pressure off yourself because you're stressed about the exam because you're stressed about the the result of the exam and the implications and the implications that will have for your life, which are probably exaggerated, to be honest. I don't want to like, I'm not saying that you're stressing out for no reason or that there's not real consequences or there's not real potential opportunities um, on the line, depending on performance levels and stuff like that. But at the same time, it's kind of like in the match scenario too, where you can't really control certain outcomes that are a little bit in the future. Like you can't control um, application processes or how this is going to affect whatever job or career that like that's so in the future and so like unpredictable that we need to we need to come back to like what we can control and what you can control is preparing as best you can. Did I prepare as best I can? I obviously did. Yeah. So you can't go in the past and regret your preparation. And you can't go in the future and worry about a potential outcome. And so that just leaves you two things. What preparation can you do now? And maybe some of that preparation is stop over studying and do some of the stillness and stuff like that. So that's kind of, um, but yeah, we've had, um, we had athletes do the tools like right before SATs and really bump up their yeah. score and stuff just by adding a little bit of, you know, meditation. Um, we'll put the pop stillness exercise back on the portal for all you exam takers it's a really good one yeah that's a good thing and on, another thing i wanted to say about about this um is um oh i got a question in um it didn't come in just now but it came in this week on the dms and the question was um or it was just a comment it was like there's nothing act i can actually do in the car on the portal right now and so we might want to keep at least one sitting base pop up there um because yeah. they're all everything was movement based today so that's yep. just another thing but yeah, yeah. stillness is a because that's not a walking or anything mm -hmm. like that throwing that one back on and um yeah if you guys have specific requests to like on tools mm -hmm. let us know the new, pops are in. new pops are in new pops are in new pops are in so we're posting everything tonight Okay. Dream strokes on its way. Dream strokes on its way. It's flowing its way. Over. Come on, Jeff. We're gonna have Jeff on. He's the guy cranking out the music right now. I don't know if you guys like the music in the pops and the live stroke and the dream stroke. And the primes. And the primes. He literally made He's all. He's made hundreds of tracks for he, us. Like I don't like I don't think you guys realize. Like you probably realize that your favorite artist comes out with an album like once every like three years. <laughs> like that's like a sixty minutes of music that they create for like three years. Well, some of them tour and like whatever, but like a couple years. This guy for like three years has been creating music for... I think he's made 220 tracks. 220 tracks. He went to school for this and he just like busted out this first per our request. Like, and so we're going to have him on and, and talk a little bit about what he's trying to do on the music side for any of you guys interested. Because um, the music is a big part of this. Yep. It carries the weight a little bit. So... Anyways, rambling a little. Any last questions? You got anything last to go? We're at 8.50 already. It's crazy. Got my little hourglass here to keep us on. I think it's a half hourglass. I have my little half hourglass to keep us on. Um, <laughs> keep us on track. But um, cool. You got anything? All right. Guys, two weeks left. Finish strong. Let's go. Finish strong. We'll see you on the next one. Cool. Peace. Peace.